morning. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to today's EE Colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. David Griffiths. Um, he, David uh, got a PhD from the University of Delaware, working in the area of communications and signal processing. And thereafter, worked on some satellite networking work, doing analysis of uh, SATCOM systems. David is currently with the Wireless Networking Division for uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, which is listed there. Some of you may know NIST for the work that it does uh, in the area of uh, measurements. But the group that uh, David uh, works for, which is the communication, or rather the lab that he works for, the CTL, or the Communications Technology Lab in Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, focuses at this point on a really important and emerging technology, which is abbreviated over there called PSCR, Public Safety Communications Research. Um, for those of you who followed the recent uh, you know, disasters, both uh, hurricanes and, and, and fires, uh, his work will be a good context to appreciate the importance of this uh, technology, public safety communications research, i.e., the communication needs that are kind of unique and specific to first responders, firefighters, emergency uh, medical personnel, uh, both in the context of an ongoing event as well as in the context of recovery, uh, of fast recovery from a large-scale event. So um, he's going to talk, uh, to set up his talk, uh, give further context, he's going to talk at, uh, about adding features to the technology that we all use for our cell phones, which is a 4G uh, LTE, long-term evolution system. The features that he talks about are proposed, not there. And this is called direct device-to-device -device discovery. So let's welcome David. OK, good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, as Sumit uh, said during his kind introduction, my name is Dave Griffith. I'm with NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, in the Communications Technology Laboratory, CTL. What you see behind me are the flat irons at the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains near Boulder, Colorado. This is not what I get to see when I look out my window, because I am in Gaithersburg, Maryland, where NIST's main campus is. Most of CTL actually is in Boulder. The Public Safety Communications Research Division is located there, as well as the RF Technologies Division, which has one part that does a lot of work on, on ultra-high-speed electronics, and another part that does a lot of work on fields and waves, and includes things like a state-of-the-art uh, anechoic chamber, where we've uh, implemented uh, robotic technology that's typically used in the auto industry to obtain uh, measurements of antenna field patterns with submillimeter accuracy, highest accuracy in the world at the moment. OK. So this is the outline of the talk. And I'm going to start by just laying the groundwork and talking a little bit about what device-to-device -device or D2D communications are. And then I'll talk about the discovery function, which is just one piece of the control plane or control functions associated with this very complicated set of standards that are being developed by the third generation partnership project, or 3GPP. And then I'll delve into some of the work that we've been doing over the past couple years on analyzing the discovery function, which involves both developing mathematical models using prob uh, probabilistic and statistical methods, as well as uh, doing a lot of simulation work, both in um, uh, tools like MATLAB or Octave, as well as NS3. And then I'll wrap things up with the conclusion section. So device-to-device -device communications. Uh, if you've been reading any of the literature about device-to-device -device or D2D communications, you might hear, hear the term uh, PROSE, P-R-O-S-E. That's an abbreviation for proximity services. And this was first introduced uh, in uh, release 12 of the 3GPP standards. That's not the latest release. I think we're up to release 14 at this point. There was a lot of enhancements to PROCE that occurred in release 13. And the idea behind this is to uh, implement what's called device-to-device -device communications. And the name is basically what it is. Instead of the more traditional cellular communication mode, where you have your device, and you go via an uplink from your device to a base station, and then via a downlink from the base station to the device, to use some terms that were stolen from satellite uh, communications. 
you instead have a direct communication link from one device to another device. I pull out my cell phone, and if I'm talking to you or texting you, the data is going directly from me to you, not through a base station. And this different kind of link has been dubbed a side link, as opposed to an uplink or a downlink. And the idea behind this originally was that, base, was that uh, cellular communications in, 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 uh, through the base station were becoming more and more congested as more and more people were using the data features. And the cellular providers were thinking, geez, you know, if there was a way to offload some of this traffic, it would really help us out. And that was one of the original use cases that was envisioned for D2D, that if people within a cell were talking to each other, well, fine, don't go through the base station and accumulate all of those additional latency and load on the network and, and stuff. Just have them communicate directly. However, since that's been devised, or, or since that original use case was devised, people have now uh, come up with a lot of additional use cases for D2D. One of them, of course, is advertising, the thing that makes our, our economy great. Uh, if you're in a shopping mall, for instance, and, and this is actually in the standards. This is one of the me main things that they thought. You're walking around, you're going to different stores. The store proprietor's equipment will detect that you have a D2D capable device and they can, based on your social media profile, shoot you ads and offers and other things that are tailored specifically to you in the hope that you'll come into their store and buy stuff. There's also social networking and gaming as well. If you're Playing a, if you're playing a game over you know, social media, if you're doing Pokemon Go, the, I, I had to use the classic example there, then if there are people nearby who have DDD capable devices, then you would be able to interact with them directly, again, without going to the cellular network. And then there's the case that we're looking at, public safety. And this is particularly the case in terms of network outages. Uh, when this was originally discussed, people asked in the standards meetings, you know, do we want to enable out of coverage communications for commercial uses? And the commercial provider said, no, absolutely not. Because you're talking about having devices be out of the control of the network provider. This is just a thing unheard of. But the public safety community said, no, we really, really need this. And, they have been, and the only use case for out of coverage in the standard is that one, public safety communications. The question is why? Well, the National Public Safety Broadband Network that's in the process of being rolled out now, uh, the announcement was just made in the spring that AT&T is going to be building the network for FirstNet. It's going to incorporate cell towers using LTE uh, for public safety personnel, police, firefighter, and, and, uh, and ambulance to use. Uh, but the thing is that there are situations where you can't go through a base station. Uh, one very simple scenario is you've got firefighters who are going into a building and the penetration loss from the walls is so great that they can't communicate with the base station. Uh, at the public safety communication stakeholders meeting that I was at uh, and that NIST hosts, uh, we were in San Antonio last June, I had firefighters come up to us at our booth and say to us, we switch our radios into out of coverage mode the instant we walk into the building because nothing sucks harder than being in a building and having your radio suddenly inform you that I can't talk to the outside world as you've got flames and smoke around you, all around you. It's not a good feeling. They'd rather just be in that mode to begin with. So being able to communicate directly with your peers or your colleagues when you're in a situation like that's very important. Another use case is that if you're out in the middle of nowhere uh, and you're operating far beyond the range of a cell tower, you've got search and rescue people out in the cascade, some hiker is lost. There is, the nearest cell tower is 10 miles away. They need to be able to communicate with each other in a situation like that. And the third case, unfortunately, is when the, public, is when the cellular network is degraded or destroyed. After Katrina came through, the cellular network in southern Louisiana was basically gone. They had ham radio operators coming in volunteering their services to enable connectivity for the rescuers. Uh, after Hurricane Maria came through Puerto Rico, the cellular network there is gone. And even if it were there, there's not enough power to drive it at this point. They, you would need device-to-device -device communications in a situation like that. And in wine country, at least 80 cell towers have been turned to ash. By the, by the wildfires. 
And again, the only way that you're going to be able to communicate with people, and in a, in a deadly situation like that, where you've got fire, fires that are moving at like 200 feet per second because of fuel overload and high winds, you really need situational awareness in a case like that. So situational awareness for public safety personnel is the difference between life and death. So device-to-device -device communications involves a lot of control functions in, in order to make, be able to make it work. The main ones are discovery, synchronization, and then communications itself. Discovery is where devices send control messages to each other to say, I'm here and I support the following device-to-device -device applications or capabilities. Synchronization is where these devices will send messages to each other to enable them to get their clocks synced. Because these are digital devices. If your clocks aren't synced, you're not going to be able to detect bit boundaries properly. And you're not going to be able to communicate at all. So synchronization is an absolute prerequisite for communication. Discovery is less so. It's more of a soft prerequisite. Uh, you may know that those devices are out there, but if you don't get the discovery message from them, you may not know all of the capabilities that they have at the moment. And then communication itself is the actual sending of data, which of course is why all this stuff is here in the first place. And that involves advertising the data that you're going to send, and then actually sending the data. Now the thing is that uh, you can do either direct or assisted discovery, like I said, uh, for out-of-coverage communications, that's what we're concerned with, with public safety. You don't have a uh, base station act as an arbiter. For a lot of the commercial applications that uh, industry is envisioning, you would have the base station acting as an arbiter to assign resources to devices that are doing D2D -D communications. The device would say to the base station, I need resources uh, in order to send a message, the base station would then say, OK, use this set of subframes, and subframes are millimeter, millisecond long chunks of time, and use this set of resource blocks, uh, which are 18 kilohertz wide chunks of frequency, in, and, and those will be for your exclusive use. And then they just send and they don't interfere with each other. In out of coverage communications, there's nobody to do the arbitration. And so the devices fall back on a random access scheme, essentially. So for synchronization, for, uh, synchronization but also especially for discovering communications, you pick resources at random, and then you hope to God that nobody picked the same resources that you did. Otherwise, you're going to communicate at the same time, and there's going to be interference. Now, there are some mechanisms that have been introduced in the standard to ameliorate some of these effects. And I'll go into these in a little more detail here. OK, so the direct discovery itself. Uh, this is a busy slide. I apologize for the busy slide. Uh, but the idea is that, as I, as I talked about resources, the way to think about this, and I think this will not go over everybody's, anybody's heads because you're all EEs. So if I talk about a time frequency grid, you're not going to go, huh? Um, but, if I, but if I am, uh, let me just get into that in a little bit of detail. You're seeing an example of a time frequency grid here on the, on the, on the right side of the slide. You encounter these a lot when you take a signal processing class that talks about the short time Fourier transform. Because the idea there is that rather than just getting a representation of the signal over all time, because you, know, you take the Fourier transform and like you know, uh, delta functions go to constants and sinusoids go to delta functions and so forth, uh, that captures the behavior over the whole range of time. A short time Fourier transform looks at a small window of the signal, does the Fourier transform there. So you can actually see things like chirp signals show a nice graceful arc uh, as you're plotting frequency versus time. Sinusoids are straight lines, you know, solid, you know, same frequency over the time domain. Here what you have is you've got the time domain on the x-axis, the frequency domain is on the right axis, and you've got a bunch of blocks of time and frequency space that are set aside to act as the discovery channel. And this whole notion of defining channels this way kind of boggles people a little bit. Because when you think of radio channels, you're used to thinking of turning a dial on your AM or FM radio, and a particular band of frequency is the channel. And that's all it's used for. Here, it's a little fuzzier, because what happens is you've got your time and frequency plane, and you can carve out little chunks in that plane that repeat periodically. And, that, and those 
blocks of re periodically repeating resources are your channel that you use. And the bandwidth for LTE is chopped up into lots of these channels. You've got channels for the discovery process. You've got channels to support the synchronization signal. You've got pr uh, channels to, pr to support the actual transmission of data. You've got channels for random access functions as well. They're all just chunks of time and frequency domain blocks here. So uh, what happens when you've got a discovery message to send is that you're going to pick some of these resources and you're going to send the message during that, during that block of time. And uh, what the uh, standard also says is that because this is not a reliable channel, you'll send the, ch the, the message multiple times as well. So if you've got channel effects like fading or shadowing, hopefully that'll, that'll fix uh, some of that problem. OK. Uh, this just gets into the discovery message itself. And like I said, the, the whole point of this uh, is just to send advertisements to other devices about the capabilities that, that you have. So uh, these things have a fixed size of, in this case, it's 232 bits. That's not especially important in the context of what we're talking about here. But the thing to note is that it uses a fixed modulation scheme and, 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 a, and a fixed uh, packet size. One of the cool things about LTE is that it uses variable modulation encoding schemes depending on the channel conditions. So if I have a channel where my signal to noise ratio is terrible, I can use a very conservative uh, modulation encoding scheme. I'll use a low rate code combined with a signal constellation with only a couple bits per symbol. But if I'm in a, ch but if I'm in a channel environment where my signal to noise ratio is great, then I can use like uh, a 64 qualm constellation where I've got multiple bits per symbol and I can use a high rate code because I'm not, probably not going to get many bit rares anyway. And so it's a very flexible scheme, but that's for the data. For, the, for control functions like this, you typically have a modulation scheme, an A coding scheme that's defined. Okay. And uh, the PROSI application code, that's just an allocated pronouncing UE. And uh, this is composed of multiple fields that I'm not going to get into too much here, except to just show the overall shape of the discovery message that goes out. The idea here is that you've got a, excuse me, is that you've got a uh, public land mobile network ID that's at the beginning of the message, and then 160 bits for other things, and those are typically Again, these application codes, like this is, what I can, this is what I can support, as well as various labels, which are subcategories. So you can see some examples of these application codes that are in that field of that, uh, of that uh, message that it, it might say like, okay, you know, I've got uh, you know, these business categories and then these particular you know, types of businesses that, that are, or, or business type identifiers that are associated with that. OK, so I mentioned about collisions and uh, how this is a problem with public safety communications. 3GPP defined a sort of very crude throttling method for dealing with this uh, to reduce the likelihood of collisions. And the idea is that you have this thing called a transmission probability threshold, which is a number between 0 and 1. If I have a discovery message to send, one of these 242-bit things, that's going to take up a certain number of, uh, that's going to take up two resource blocks in the discovery channel. Then what, I, what my device is going to do is it's going to generate a random number that's uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And then it's going to compare that number to the threshold. If the number is less than the threshold, great, transmit. So like in this case, my threshold was a half. I generate a random number of 0.293749, less than, send. But if I generate a random number that's greater than the threshold, like here, 0.697, that's bigger than the threshold, the device will wait until the next occurrence of the discovery resource pool, and then it'll try again, and it'll try again, and it'll try again. I mean, you might have a situation where you get some bad die rolls in a row, essentially, but eventually you'll, you'll end up sending the, uh, the message out. Another thing that we have to take into account with these uh, models that we were building is what's called the half-duplex effect. 
A half duplex device is one that can either be in transmit or receive mode, but not both simultaneously. So if I'm sending in a particular subframe, I'm not able to receive anything from anybody else that occurs during that time. So that means that even if no collisions occur when a bunch of devices choose resources, if they were to say all pick the same subframe to send it, they're not going to hear each other. So here's what happens. Uh, it, we, we pick a UE of interest and we denote its selection in this block of squares that represents the discovery channel resource pool by the X and the circle that are in blue. So the UE of interest picks this resource and then it's not going to be able to receive any messages in that fifth subframe. So we color that gray to, to denote that it can't get anything. So a device that picks that resource is not going to be able to hear the message from our UE of interest. And because these, de because these devices are picking the resources uniformly, that means they're picking them with equal probability. That also means that they're picking the subframes equal with equal probability. So if I have n sub t subframes and I have n sub f pairs of physical resource blocks, and these are the actual variables that are used in the 3GPP standard, then the probability of picking a given subframe is just one over that number. So probability of picking a given PRB pair, 1 over n sub f. Probability of picking a given subframe set, 1 over n sub t. Pretty straightforward. So devices that pick other resources, if they don't pick subframe 5 with probability 1 over n sub t, they'll pick one of the other ones. The probability of that is 1 minus 1 over n sub t. They will get the message uh, from our uh, UE of interest that's in blue. If a collision happens, then that's going to prevent that message from getting to most of the other devices. Uh, the standard defines n sub r to be the number of resources in the resource pool, and, the, and that's just the product of number of subframes times number of resource pairs. Again, it's very, very simple. In the models that we developed over the last two years for some of the papers that I wrote, we took a very strict conservative approach to these collisions. We basically said that if somebody collides with you, you're dead, end of story. There's no way for anybody to get that message. The reality is a little more complicated uh, because if the collisions are happening and I've got like a device, so I'm here and I've got another device that's really close to me and another device that's all the way at the end of the room and they're both transmitting at the same time, the ratio of the received signal powers from those devices is such that I've got a much stronger signal from the near device than I do from the far device. Even though they're colliding, I might actually still be able to hear the closer device's signal over the garbage that's being generated from over there. So you actually do a little better, but what we like about this model is that it basically bounds the performance. I mean, you can't do worse than this where nobody hears you. Okay, so now we'll get into some of our research here. So this is our uh, analytical model of the uh, discovery resource pool. This was presented at uh, uh, Infocom in Atlanta uh, back in the spring. So what we wanted to uh, address was just what is the distribution of the time required for a device, and in LTE parlance, devices are user equipment or UEs. A UE can be a cell phone, it can be a laptop, it's anything that's communicate, it's anything that an end user is using that is communicating over the, the LTE network. And the question is, like, if I started from zero, like I just have a bunch of devices, they haven't discovered each other, how long does it take them with all of these constraints that they're dealing with to discover each other? So what we did with this paper is we used a Markov chain model uh, to model the progress of a single UE in going from a starting state, I haven't discovered anybody, to a single absorbing state where I've discovered everybody. And then we used NS3 to validate our results. So uh, I would ask you to bear with me. This is a little hairy, uh, the math that is coming. But just what I'd like to do, so like don't worry about the math that's appearing on the screen. What I'm going to try and focus on is just the general outlines of what we did to give you a feel for our approach in doing this. So the first thing that we did was we had our Markov chain model. So if you look at the figure at the top, for a case where there's three other devices to discover, this is what the, this is what the chain would look like. Uh, if you haven't had a probability or statistics class yet, 
Uh, the way that Markov chains are, are used is they're, they're used to model random processes where something is going from one state to another and it's doing it in a random fashion. In this case, uh, the state from the point of view of the UE that we're looking at, or the device that we're looking at, is how many other devices have I discovered? So I start out, let's see if I can actually use this here. Yeah. All right, I start out in state zero, and I'm gonna progress to one state, two st state one, state two, or three, as I, discover device, as I discover other devices. And these arrows represent the possible transitions that I can have. So like if I'm starting in state zero, when a given occurrence of the discovery resource pool occurs, everybody sends their message, and then I look at what happened as a result of that barrage of messages that took place. And maybe I didn't discover anybody. Maybe they all collided with each other, I heard nothing. Maybe they all transmitted at the same time that I did and I heard nothing. In that case, I stay in state zero. That's denoted by that arrow that loops around. That uh, symbol next to it, T00, is the probability of staying in state zero given that you started in state zero. In all of these T sub ijs, it's the probability of going, of, 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 of going uh, from state J given that you're in state I. So I could also have a very fortuitous occurrence where I go from state zero to state three, and the probability of doing that is T sub zero three, the probability of going from state zero to state three. You collect all of these transition probabilities into the matrix that's shown here at the bottom. This is the state transition matrix for this Markov chain. And it's just, it's a collection of probabilities. Uh, the really neat thing is that if you have like a, uh, an, an, a, a vector that describes your initial state for the system. So in this case, the vector would be one, zero, zero, zero. I am definitely in state zero. The probability that I start in any of these states, I'm definitely in state zero. Probability that I start in state one, state two, or state three is zero. I can then take this T matrix, multiply it by that vector, and then get the probability of being in each of those states at the end of the first cycle. If I, want to the pro if I want to know the probability of being in each of these states at the end of the cycle, I take t squared and post multiply it by that initial vector and so on and so on and so on. And, I can, and if, if you have a Markov chain that it does not have absorbing states like this, which is probably what you will run into or have bad memories of having run into in your probability classes, then what you, do, what you can do is you can manipulate this transition matrix and get what are called the steady state probabilities for the Markov chain. So like if I start it in any state, any state at all, and I just let it run for a really long time so that all the transients damp out, then I can, then before I even look at it, I can say my probability of being in a certain state is such. And, 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 then, and then you'll see like if you do a lot of simulations, it'll actually match that. You don't have steady state probabilities with a chain like this because you march inevitably toward the uh, absorbing state, which is state three there. What are we doing here? Okay, what we ended up doing for the paper was we got the discovery statistics from our trans state transition matrix. There's a, there's a matrix associated with the state transmission matrix known as the fundamental matrix. Uh, we have the derivation of that here, but the, the important thing to know is just that if you have this, um, the matrix of this form, you can partition it as, as it's shown here, and then from that get N, uh, which is just the identity matrix minus that upper left-hand chunk of the, of, the, of the state transition matrix, which in this, in this case is actually everything except for this bottom right-hand element here, which is a one. So you would basically take the three by three matrix that is the upper left-hand chunk of T, and that's your Q matrix if you're gonna actually do this. And, from, and then if you look at the elements of that matrix, what that gives you is the average number of times, so it's, these aren't probabilities, these are averages. Average number of times that the state visits, that the chain visits state J given that it started in state I. So 
if I have like n sub zero j, that's the mean number of times that I visit state j given that I start in the zero state. Well, I start in the zero state. I didn't know anything about anybody in the group. If I add up all of those average times that I visited all of those other states, that's the average number of state visits between starting and ending. That's how many cycles it took me to discover everybody. So all I have to do now is just get the state transition matrix. Easy peasy, right? Well, not exactly. Um, again, I will just go over. Basically, this nasty looking equation gives you the, the, the state transitions here. The way that we did this was that we just did repeated conditionings on all of the various events that can happen. Again, if, you've ha if you have not yet had a probability class or you have bad memories of conditional probability from probability class, there's a very important theorem in probability known as Bayes' theorem, which basically says that if I, can ha if I, if I have the probability of an event that I'm interested in, if I can condition on a bunch of related events, then I take the sum of the probability of my event of interest given this other event multiplied by the probability of that other event, sum it up over the, all, all the possible events, and yay, I've got my probability of interest. So in this case, we did that multiple times in order to get our state transition probabilities. So, we had, so as you're doing this, you have to keep track of not just how many other devices you've discovered, but which ones you've discovered and which ones you haven't discovered. So we've got m sub d, the number of devices that have been discovered so far, and m sub u, the number of devices that we haven't discovered so far. And the first thing that we conditioned on was how many of the other devices in the group are transmitting at the same time as me? They're out. I can't even consider them. And that's the probability of that happening is in that box there. And then everything in the orange is the probability of a certain number of discoveries given that that happened. Then within that orange box, we then had to condition on how many of the discovered devices occupied a particular set of resources that were outside of the subframe that we were transmitting in. And then we conditioned also on how the remaining uh, undiscovered devices distributed themselves. And so we got this, this, uh, this expression. So I'm not going to go into the details of getting all that stuff, except to, except to show this graph here, which is the uh, theoretical uh, cumulative distribution function that we generated for the number of cycles or periods that it took. And then we simulated this in NS3 as well. And we're showing 95% confidence intervals here, uh, both based on the sort of straightforward you know, 1.96 sigma over the square root of the number of runs, Thing, but we also used uh, a, a, a functional inequality as well, which gives you a better sense of uh, the uncertainty at various points in the CDF. And we found that we had uh, very good agreement uh, between those. And uh, we looked at a number of uh, scenarios uh, associated with that uh, model where we varied the number of devices. And uh, we also looked at a particular configuration for our discovery resource pool and performed you know, 10 runs with 500 trials per run. And we uh, uniform, in this case, we uniformly distributed our devices within uh, a small enough area so they could all talk to each other. That actually is a, uh, an area of active research in communications uh, called stochastic geometry. In a lot of communications papers that have been put out, people assume that these devices are just uniformly distributed within an area, or they follow what's known as a two-dimensional Poisson process. Uh, which is a way of placing things randomly. But the thing is, in reality, devices aren't usually uniformly distributed. There's variations. They tend to clump and so forth. And that's one of the things that we're looking at with our ongoing research with this. Uh, let's see. And then we validated this uh, using six scenarios, uh, using the parameters that I, that I mentioned here. And in this case, we used a transmission probability threshold of one. So we weren't looking at throttling the transmissions uh, because that introduced an additional layer of complexity that really was affecting the tractability of the model in this case. So that may be something that we would revisit. But what we wanted to do was basically get some bounds on performance. And again, we had very good results for different pool sizes. Uh, and what this also showed was uh, that 
not only do you, I mean, naturally there's the obvious conclusions that come from this, right? You do better if you have fewer devices, you do better if you have a bigger pool. But one of the big things that comes out of this is the shape of the pool matters. And we found this when we were looking at the control channel as well. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, about that is that because of the half duplex effect, adding more resources doesn't necessarily get you better performance if you don't do it wisely. It's better to have a pool that, it, if you have a fixed number of resources to play with, it is better to have a pool that's stretched out in time and takes up fewer frequency blocks than it is to have a pool that's squashed in, free, in time and takes up a big band because your half duplex effect becomes more and more pronounced the more squashed your pool is. The worst case scenario would be is if you had a pool that was only one subframe wide, everybody transmits and, and interferes with each other and nobody can hear anything in a situation like that. Uh, so the takeaways from our Infocom paper were that, were that you know, of course we got excellent agreement uh, and, and as I said, increasing the pool size did produce a noticeable shift, but again, the, the shape of the pool matters. Uh, this, this next piece uh, that we worked on uh, was presented at Globecom at the end of last year. And this is work that I did with uh, Fiona Lyons, and she was one of our Pathways students at NIST. Uh, Pathways is a program that NIST runs where we have students come and work with us uh, on a, uh, on a part-time basis, and they basically get credit toward eventual employment with us. And uh, Fiona was a big help in developing the model and also in writing the code uh, to validate this. And this was actually the, some of the first uh, stuff that we did uh, in this area. So again, we have a group of out of coverage devices that all have to talk to each other. And we need to come up with a performance metric. So this is a little different than the metric that we were using for the Infocom paper where we were just trying to look at the distribution of the number of cycles that it takes for one device to discover all the others. Here we're just gonna pick two devices at random out of this group. And then we're gonna consider a discovery message transmission from one device to the other device. And the question is, what is the probability that that discovery message transmission actually succeeds? And here we're actually taking the transmission probability threshold into account. That's the variable theta that's on the slides here. Well, to start out, uh, the transmitter has to decide to, dis to send. So we have theta there for the initial part of this probability. And the receiver has to not send its own message in the subframe that the transmitter is using. And that happens with probability one minus theta over n sub t. And I have to take the product of those because this, this is the intersection of these two things. I have to transmit the receiver and the receiver has to not pick my subframe. And, our last and, the other n minus two, n u minus two UEs in the group do not transmit using my resource. So they avoid blocking the message with their interference. Each one of those does not pick my resource and does not transmit it with probability one minus theta over n sub r. I mean, the way you can think about this with these two things in the parentheses is that for a device to interfere with me, it has to choose to transmit. It does that with probability of theta and it has to pick my resource, which it does with probability one over n sub r. So the, prob the overall probability of interfering with me and ruining my day is theta times one over n sub r. So theta over n sub r. Anything other than that event is fine. I'm not interfered with. So one minus theta over n sub r is the probability of not colliding with me. Because the devices all pick resources independently of each other, the probability that these NU minus two devices collectively do not interfere with me is their individual non-interference probability, one minus theta over N sub R, to the NU minus two power. And that expression now at the bottom is our overall successful transmission probability. And again, N sub T is the number of subframes, N sub R is the total number of resources, that's N sub T minus N sub F, and N sub U is the number of UEs. So what we want to do is find the value of theta that maximizes this successful transmission probability. And it also turns out that it minimizes the mean number of periods for the discovery of all the devices because since devi devices don't pick a resource and stick with it forever, every time the period comes around, they make a fresh pick. So these are independent trials that you're conducting. The result of that is 
that uh, you've, you've basically got uh, uh, Bernoulli trials occurring. And so the mean number of uh, trials for, for a successful transmission is 1 over p of, p of theta in this case. So if I maximize p of theta, I minimize 1 over p of theta. OK. And what I'm not showing here, uh, we have it in the paper, was that the way that you optimize theta in this case is that you take the derivative of that p of theta term and you set it equal to 0. Many, many times, if you're doing optimization, you will do this and you will end up with an expression that you can't solve. You know, you'll even feed it into mathematic and mathematic will go, I don't, I don't know. You know. Here we were very fortunate in that we had a rational expression which was, and the, there was, a, there was a, a product in the numerator, but one of the terms in the numerator that was the key term was quadratic in theta. And so just using a little quadratic formula, we were able to come, with, come up with a nice expression for the optimal transmission probability threshold that's just a function of the pool parameters and the number of devices in the group. So the other, th oh, and the other thing that I should mention here is that in the standard, I mean, this for the, the formula that we used, I mean, basically, if you give it a bunch of parameters, you'll get some number between 0 and 1. The 3GPP standard does not define just any old value between 0 and 1 to use for this transmission probability threshold. You're basically restricted to multiples of a quarter. Quarter, half, 3 quarter, 1. That's it. There's no reason you can't use other values. Uh, but, in our, but in our case, what you can do if you're using this algorithm, if you know the environment that you're in, if you know the pool parameters, and if you know the number of devices, you use the formula and you just round to the nearest quarter. Of course, making sure that you don't round down to zero, because then you'll never transmit at all. We validated this with uh, NS3 simulations as well. And you can see the graphs here. So, uh, and this is the number of periods needed to discover all the devices in the group. So we had a different number of res so we so we looked at uh, a number of different cases where we varied the number of resources and we varied the number of devices and we plotted the mean group discovery times so that's one over p of theta uh, versus the transmission probability and we were just looking at four values here so these these aren't these aren't continuous curves you're, you're, these are just discrete curves we're just showing the lines between those points uh, to to indicate you know what's connected to what. And we conducted 20 Monte Carlo run, uh, uh, 20 Monte Carlo simulations with 50 trials per run, and what you can see here is is that uh, we were is that there's there's several trends that occur. I mean, first of all, that uh, you certainly do better with more resources, uh, but also that again again we found that the shape of the group matters as well. Um, and uh, that obviously you're going to do worse if you have more devices uh, you know, for a given group size. But in this case, we're able to, to then identify the optimal values associated with each of these scenarios. And uh, interestingly, uh, in this case, uh, the optimal value of 1 that's associated with the 2UE2 resource case uh, occurs because of the particular geometry of the, uh, of the pool in that case. That was, that was sort of a limiting case that we looked at. Uh, we also did simulations in MATLAB using, using similar assumptions. And the thing that I, that I want to point out to you in this graph here is the uh, blown up areas that we're, sh that we're showing here. Because what we also did when we generated these graphs was we went back and we looked at the model for the Infocom paper, where we were looking at uh, the number of periods required for a device to discover everybody. Because remember that when, I did, when we did that model, we were just looking at the case where the transmission probability was 1. We weren't looking at, well, what if it's a quarter? What if it's a half? What if it's 3 quarters? What we fortuitously found and it was an enormous delight to see these graphs, is that the value of theta that minimizes the uh, probability, that minimizes the number of, of cycles for two UEs to discover each other also minimizes the number of cycles for a UE to discover everybody in the group. So that what that means is that rather than going through the torturous Monte Carlo simulation that we did or trying to extend it, using this very simple formula, you can actually maximize performance with regard to that performance metric in addition to this rather simple, simple performance metric. 
Uh, and we also were able to achieve the sort of uh, triple uh, agreement that uh, we like to see with our simulations. We tend to do our mathematical model. We do Monte Carlo simulations using MATLAB or Octave or something like that. And we do NS3 as well. And you ideally want all three of those things to line up in a nice way, or at least within, within the 95% confidence intervals. The reason for that is that uh, you, when you do a simulation in MATLAB or Octave, you're not simulating everything that is going on. You're distilling out the essential elements of the model that you're constructing, and you're just simulating that. What that means is that if you goofed when you were making the model, you will produce a Monte Carlo simulation that shows that your goof was well done, but that you still have a goof there. Having a simulator like NS3 that's been vetted externally and, and that a lot of people use that really captures everything that is going on allows you to discern goofs in your model. And I'll tell you a potentially, well, it's not really an embarrassing story because this is how science works, about uh, a paper that we're actually in the process of finalizing where we're modeling the shared channel for communications. And we had constructed a theoretical model where we were looking at, in, in this case, the shared channel breaks the frequency domain up into a bunch of bands. And so when you're going to transmit, you pick a band, and then you pick subframes within that band to send your data. And so you have to look at, uh, if I'm transmitting in a given band, and somebody else transmits in my band and they land on me, they're going to collide with some of my transmissions, and that's going to reduce the probability that my message gets through. But then the devices that pick other bands, there you just have to worry about, is there a half duplex effect? And can I hear enough of the surviving non-collided transmissions from the guy I want to receive my message from? What we did was we modeled the, the in-band phenomenon fine, and then we looked at the out-of-band stuff. And we initially said, well, the only way you're going to run into problems is if you pick the same set of subframes as the transmitter. Because if you pick a different set, then you're going to have at least one subframe free, right? You should be fine, right? And we simulated, the, we did the Monte Carlo simulation, and it agreed with the theoretical model. Wonderful. Then we simulated an NS3, and we were consistently overestimating our performance. And we were, go, and we were going crazy until our colleague who was doing the NS3 simulation said, it's not enough to have at least one subframe visible. It has to be one of the uncollided subframes that's visible. Oh, we said back and rework the model and now everything lines up. This is why you need to not just check one way, but as many agreeing uh, lines of evidence as possible in order to make sure that your model is rock solid. Uh, so in the time that we have left, uh, I'll talk about some of the work. This was done that we did as well that was reported at IWCMC uh, in uh, Valencia, Spain this past June. Uh, the primary author here was not myself, it was our guest researcher, Aziza Ben Mospa, who did a lot of this work. And what she did, uh, here's the formula actually that we produced here. Again, this is the result of the quadratic. And uh, the reason that it's case based is because if you just plug stuff into that expression that's on the bottom there in the bracket, you can get a number bigger than one. Uh, in that case, you just round down to one because you don't want a transmission success probability bigger than one. It turns out that the condition for that is if the number of devices is less than that upper bound that's, that's in the expression there. What Aziza noted uh, and, and we acknowledged was that this model assumes that you know how many devices you're talking to uh, in addition to knowing the pool parameters. And it also assumes that you have this sort of ideal situation where uh, you've got an ideal channel and collisions always result in death for the message. And she said, well, what if, what if we could incorporate an algorithm into the discovery process that learns as we go? So we adjust our transmission probability threshold in response to how many devices are there. Because typically, the way that this is going to be done with the current round of devices that are coming out from the manufacturers is that if you're in out of coverage mode, there will be some value for that transmission probability threshold that's just hard coded into the firmware. And that's just what it is, and that's just what you're going to use. And, what, and if you're a manufacturer and you've decided to do that, what you're probably going to do is look at a bunch of test scenarios and say, well, on average, I'm probably going to have n devices near me. And so based on that, we're going to pick, 
a half for our value. Or, we'll get, or some of them will just say, oh, forget it. Let's just pick one and be done with it. Uh, but in this case, uh, what you can do is actually adaptively uh, 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 modify that in order to account for what's going on. So what Aziza did was she modified our uh, performance metric that's in the equation there to have different values for the transmission threshold theta uh, in, each of, in, e, uh, in the various parts of the expression. And based on that, uh, she, she said, well, we know that each device has its own transmission probability that, that's based on that formula that we used. And so this is, this is our, our, uh, our algorithm-based success probability. And the probability of a successful reception, again, because I said you know, this is independent trials, uh, it's going to be one minus, one minus the probability of success to the nth power ends the number of periods. So if you then turn that around and solve for n, the minimum number of, peri the, the minimum number of periods that you should wait before you decide that, 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 a, that a transmitter is turned off or moved away is given by that ratio. Because the thing is, if you've got a dynamic group where things are coming or going, if somebody leaves, you're not going to hear discovery messages from them anymore. But then the question is, are they really gone, or have they just gotten a bunch of bad die rolls in, a, in succession? And so this n min value that's at the bottom of the slide was an attempt to come up with a number of periods to wait before you declare, OK, I'm whatever percent positive that that device isn't there anymore. OK. And what she also did was she proposed a modification to the discovery message. This is not in the standard yet, uh, I should say. But what we would do is we would steal two bits from that information field that's the end of the message in order to indicate uh, whether our probability of transmission has changed or it's still the initial value. Uh, and uh, to do that, we would also maintain the size of the application code. So instead of having 160 bits, we would go down to uh, uh, 157 bits. You know, two bits for the uh, allowed values, like this is our value, and then the extra bit to indicate that there was a delta. So it would end up looking alike. If we can make this bigger. There we go. So the flag would be. So the 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 new value would be the uh, the least significant bits there, and the flag would be the bit above that. So she came up with a static algorithm that basically, uh, you know, just to summarize how, th how this works here, as a UE is processing messages from other devices, uh, it'll record the current time. And then if it gets a message from a device that was never encountered before, it'll create a vector for that, or, or, or a record for that, I'm sorry. And it'll set the time saying, OK, this is when I first heard this guy. And then it'll do an update. Uh, what it will then do for devices that have already generated messages that it's received is it will calculate the n min, that threshold value based on that, and then it'll determine, is it safe for me to delete the record or not? And then it'll just continue doing that for each successive period. Uh, she also defined a second uh, enhanced dynamic algorithm that also includes a recalculation of the uh, transmission probability threshold based on the new value for the total number of devices, and then advertises that. So she also validated this work. We did this with uh, NS3 simulations in addition to uh, simulations using Monte Carlo. Uh, we assumed that we had a carrier frequency of 700 megahertz in this case, because that's the frequency band that's going to be used for public safety communications. We had uh, three resource blocks pairs in the frequency domain and five subframes in the time domain, so 30 resources in this case, uh, 320 millisecond discovery period, and a single repetition for our transmission. So we weren't going for the full three uh, repetitions in this case, uh, full three repetitions in this case. 10 megahertz bandwidth for the channel. And we used an ideal uh, channel for the first set of, of results that we generated for the IWCMC paper. And we also use the cost 231 propagation model to look at what happens when you actually incorporate a more realistic channel model as well. And we were looking for a success criteria uh, of 99%, 95%, and 90%. And uh, what those relate to are basically the, the, that's the probability of successfully determining that a device has left and has not just made a bunch of bad die rolls. Okay. 
Uh, and we, we had an arrival scenario that we looked at where we have a bunch of initial devices that are already in a particular area. This is like a group of public safety responders that are responding to an incident. And then we've got a bunch of additional devices that are joining them. So we varied the number of initial devices in the group. And uh, we, we ran the NS3 simulation so that we let the group get into steady state first. And then about 100 seconds into the simulation, we had the additional devices show up. And then we looked at the transients associated with their arrival and, and how uh, the algorithm performed in response to this initial, uh, in, in, to this arrival of additional devices here. Okay, so here we have uh, our curves for group one discovering, oh yeah, and I should say here also that uh, group one is, let's see if it will let me get back, it's not gonna let me get back, okay. Okay, so group one is the initial group of devices. Group two is the group of arriving devices, essentially. So we started uh, doing this, and we, and, uh, we have, uh, we looked at four, st uh, five static and five dynamic cases. And for each one of these cases, you know, the number of UEs is the same for the, for the corresponding case. So we had 10 UEs, 30, 50, and 70 in the initial group. And static just means that we're not running the dynamic algorithm. We're just, We've just got a fixed uh, uh, transmission probability, and we hang on to that for the entire duration of the scenario. And we used, four, we used the four 3GPP values to do that. So quarter, half, three quarters, one. And the result of that is that for the static algorithm, of, uh, of, uh, of course, you're going to see variation in terms of the number of periods that it takes, because since you're locked into using a particular transmission probability threshold, you're going to do worse the further you get away from the optimal value. So like if you look at the blue curve on top, I've got 90 devices there. It's going to take a long time for them to discover each other. It's also a crowded field. You really don't want to have your transmission probability threshold set to one in a case like that. A quarter is, is actually a value between a quarter and a half is roughly the optimal value for that. So the solid curve shows that you do really well if your transmission probability threshold is low and as you raise it to, up to one, you're doing worse and worse and worse. For other values here, uh, depending on what the on what the, the threshold is, you're going to you're going to do well close to it and worse away. And notice, even when I've got ten devices, that's the yellow curve that's at the bottom here. My optimal value in that case is one. I do worse if I have. Uh, a transmission probability uh, threshold of a quarter. And you might at first say, well, why would that be? Because you're actually reducing the collision probability. The problem is that, if, that then you're going on average four cycles between transmissions. And so in a case like this with this many resources, you're probably going to get everything through to everybody else in a single cycle or two. That introduces too much weighting. And so that's why you do worse for those values. The dashed lines correspond to our simulations. And what they show is we're getting the same result, which is close to the optimal result, regardless of what initial value we used for our, for our transmission probability threshold. Because what happens is the algorithm runs, everybody adapts their transmission probability threshold, they lock onto the optimal value, and then they're all transmitting at the rate that they should. And so we're seeing really good performance here for this case. Oh, so, okay. I'm getting low battery messages here from the laptop, so I'm going to try and wrap this up really quick. We're at 7%. Uh, these are curves for uh, the initial group discovering the arrivals. And uh, like I said, here we, we start the clock at the 306 period mark because that's when the arrivals show up and start transmitting. And, and again, uh, we're using what you're seeing along the x-axis here are the initial transmission probabilities that everybody is, is using. We also use those for the arrivals as well. And again, what we can see is how uh, with our enhanced algorithm, the initial value of theta is really irrelevant in this case, but that you end up doing a lot worse in this case when you have the arrivals uh, showing up. Because now what you've done is you've increased the group size essentially, and, and, and now I've got a hundred devices and I need to complete the discovery of all these additional devices that I'm dealing with. Uh, these are results for uh, the new arrivals discovering everyone else, 
And uh, in the case of group two discovering its own members, that's basically the same uh, behavior of group one discovering group one. Uh, I mean, again, now we have a group of 100 devices, so it's, we're gonna, it's gonna take longer. Uh, and then on the right, we have the graph showing the number of periods needed to complete the discovery by group two. Uh, and again, we're showing that, that here in this case especially, uh, if you have a high in, uh, transmission probability threshold that's hard coded in, you end up really suffering in terms of the number of periods. This means that you've got a big time constant built into the system if you're, doing, you're using a non-adaptive scheme. Okay, how are we doing on time here? Okay, uh, we have a couple additional slides here. I'm just gonna go over these very, very fast. We also looked at a departure scenario. And in this case, we, gen we plotted the cumulative distribution functions of the, of the number of cycles uh, required to uh, respond to that. And again, we, we found that, that we had uh, good results with the algorithm uh, independently of the initial uh, value that was chosen. Uh, and also, uh, we have results here after 100, uh, after 100 seconds uh, for the departure scenario for these, for these values as well. Okay. And I think I'm gonna stop here at this point. And I'm just gonna wrap up by saying that uh, this, this work here is, is what we've done so far, but it's ongoing. And uh, we have additional work that's taking place that incorporates more of the channel effects into the theoretical models. Uh, we've also had, some of my colleagues have done a lot of work on the synchronization function. We've gotten several papers published on that front. And we, have, uh, we had a paper published at ICC in Paris that looked at the uh, control channel performance for device to device. And we have a paper that we're gonna be submitting to ICC in Kansas City next year on the shared channel. Uh, for communications. So with that, I apologize for running over a little bit, but I'd be happy to take any questions from you guys at this point. Questions? Okay. Yes. Consider the case where um, you have very few nodes inside a large area. Because I, I'm assuming that you're only talking about a single in communication from device to device right now. So what if they're moving around in a large area? Maybe? Right, so have we considered a few nodes in a large area? Uh, no, typically because we've been looking at these algorithms, we've looked at variable numbers of nodes in an area small enough that they can communicate with each other. Uh, now some of the work that we've been doing uh, with Aziza has touched on the scenario that you're looking at. Because if you do have a few nodes in a large area, what that means is you're going to have these arrival and departure events, where nodes move out of range and you can't receive messages from them anymore, uh, but then they might return at some random time. Uh, that's, that's ongoing work. Yes? Is, so is this exclusively like single hop? Is there no way to add multi-hop in, like from, from node to another node? Okay, is this single hop, is there no way to add multi-hop in? Yeah, this is single hop. Uh, the 3GPP standard does include rules for relays, but those are single relay rules at this point. So basically you would communicate with another device that would then forward your message to one device beyond that, but that's it. Uh, again, I, when we were at the stakeholders meeting in San Antonio in June, we had a couple firefighters come up to us and say, what are you doing about the partial coverage scenario? And by that they meant, what if I've got a bunch of guys who are within coverage of a base station, but I've got other people in a building who are not? How do we do relay? And they said, single relay is probably not gonna be sufficient. What we would like to see is some support for a daisy chain where you have two or more relays up to some maximum number where your performance starts to really fall apart. So that's something that we're looking at because it might need to be brought up to 3GPP as an extension to, to the standard, yeah. Let me, let me bootstrap on that question. Okay. So, you know, your metric here was device discovery of everyone in the group. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in an emergency scenario, you likely just want to get to the closest guy, you know, have a multi-hop scenario to get your data out. I really don't care to discover everyone. I mean, I might mm -hmm. want to do some for redundancy. So what, what is your thought on that, you know, the appropriateness of the metric that if I have 
Now basically, what I want is a few paths to get my data out reliably. Mm -hmm. You know, not have to get, you know, not have to discover everyone. Right, so, so this question is, you know, what about just trying to maximize the probability of being discovered by the person closest to you? So the models that we have don't take that spatial dimension into account. Uh, there, there's not the, now if everybody is close enough to receive discovery messages, maybe closest person doesn't matter so much. I thought you said you were looking at the stochastic geometry, so I thought. Yeah, now if you have a situation where people aren't uniformly distributed, if you're by yourself and everybody is clumped together or far away and there's maybe one node that's close to you, then in a stochastic geometry case like that that's non-uniform, then taking that spatial uh, information to, into account uh, would probably matter more. Now with the enhanced models that we're doing, I should say, that take the, the signal to interference ratio into account, you may get that closest neighbor recovery for free, provided they're close enough to you that their signal is more powerful than the sum of the interferer powers that are, that are transmitting in the same resource blocks. So as you know, in CSMACA, when you collide, you double size the window size, and then you use the parallel fan, which are mm -hmm. So in your approach, your theta is fixed, right? Mm -hmm. So what if, if you collide, you increase that probability? So there is no right. carrier sensing, right? Right, right. So, so the question is that in like 802.11 or various other CSMACA uh, uh, collision detection schemes, if you have a collision event, the device will respond by, by increasing the back off window and, and attempting to be more polite as a result of that. Um, in this case, if, in, in, with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with the transmission probability threshold, there is no response to a collision like that. The devices don't go, oh no, I collided with someone, and so I'm going to back off. We introduce that in a sense with the adaptive algorithm. So if there's more and more devices that are transmitting, I'm, I'm going to lower my value for theta, which is in essence, I'm increasing my back off. So like if I go from theta equal to a half to theta equal to a quarter, instead of sending on average every other period, now I'm sending on average every fourth period. Great. Um, yes. Let me just uh, conclude by saying anyone who's interested in this kind of work, we have a current project going, you know, with uh, NIST. So if you want to know, contact me, mm -hmm. uh, as well as for yeah. NIST opportunities for uh, internships and. Oh you know. yeah, I'm going to put in a shameless plug now okay. to end to end the seminar. I am well, um, among the many hats that I wear at NIST is that I am the director for the Communications Technology uh, Labs Gaithersburg Gaithersburg Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship or SURF program. And that's run by our academic affairs office. If you, if you Google NIST surf, you'll, you'll find the website. Basically what we do is we bring you out to Gaithersburg. Uh, we pay for your housing. Uh, you stay in a furnished uh, hotel. I think people were at Hyatt House last, uh, last summer. Uh, and uh, we have programs for grad students as well. Uh, the un uh, undergrads uh, get a stipend. Uh, it's basically $5,500 for the summer. You're with us for 11 weeks. You work side by side with NIST researchers. We treat you as an equal. And at the end, you pr do a presentation during an on-site colloquium and uh, uh, present your work to your peers in a 15-minute slideshow. Uh, the work that I am doing right now that I'm going to submit to ICC was the result of a collaboration with a surf student from University of North Georgia who worked with me this past summer. She basically wrote the code to do the validation using the Monte Carlo simulations. But we also have programs for grad students as well. We have postdoc fellowships also. All of this is on our Academic Affairs Office website if you just want to go check it out. So, so since I have, so for all those of you, so you can see from the work, all those of you are in 505 and maybe taking 508, it's actually useful. We'll get you hired to this, this kind of work at NIST. All right, let's thank David. Thank you.